you turn in your Bible with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 28, and we will begin in verse 10. Um, it's a book of beginnings, book of blessings, and we pick back up where we left all a life-changing encounter uh, for a man, from a man called Jacob. Jacob is the grandson of Father Abraham, third generation uh, biblical patriarch. At this time in chapter 28, Jacob is in his 70s, 71, 77 years old. So we can call him a, a 70 year old mama's boy. And he here has this interesting encounter. Uh, he he previously, this we call him a thief or a deceiver. He previously deceived his father and his brother, and he's running away from home. And I would say that up to this point, uh, Jacob had no signs of faith in God. Up to this point, Jacob was living for Jacob. But God. Those are two of the most important words of all the Bible, but God. God intervened in Jacob's life, and God showed up. He had no faith up to this point, but from now on, we will continually see Jacob's faith begin to grow. I'd venture to say that's often what's hap what happens to those who are raised in church. Young people, they begin to learn of faith. They begin to learn about the Bible and the, the faith of their parents. But it's going to take a life-changing encounter for all of us to have our own faith in God. You cannot live off the faith of someone else. It is between you and God that relationship. And I, I hope you can, can know the Bible, and I hope you can trust God, but it, no, no matter what's going on in your life, this moment and this time, we need a fresh encounter with God, church. We need God in this place. If God is not here, then all of this is meaningless. If God is not amongst us, then we're just gathering for a social call. But if God is here, that changes everything. May we encounter him this morning. If you're not a Christian, may you encounter him in a saving way. May ye be saved today, but church, we too need the presence of God in our lives at all times. That being said, let's pray. Father, we come to you with humble hearts. We desire and ask once again to experience your presence this morning. Move in this place. Move in our hearts. Transform us. Conform us. Convict us. Teach us, Father. Help us. Be not for us, far from us, but be present in this place even now. Lord, as you speak to us, may we come, may we become even more committed to you in our faith. Father, grow our faith. We pray that you will save the lost. God, would you forgive me of my sins? In Jesus' name, amen. Adrian Rogers, the great Baptist pastor, author, three-time president of the Southern Baptist Convention, Dr. Rogers was a high school football star when he surrendered his life to the Lord. One night on that same football field where he scored his touchdown, he found himself alone 
standing and seeking God and praying, Lord, I want you to use me. Well, Rogers didn't feel his prayer was fervent enough, so he humbled himself, and on bended knee, he prayed even more passionately, Lord, please use me. Still young Adrian wanted to express his availability even more. So going from standing to kneeling, now he's lying face down on the field, the field, face to the ground. He prayed again, Lord, I beg you, use me. Even that posture of earnest brokenness wasn't enough for this young man. So he took his fingers. And he, he dug a hole in the dirt, and he put his no, nose in the dirt and prayed again, Lord, I am surrendered as I know how to be. Please use me. Many years later, Dr. Rogers talked about that defining moment in his life. He says, on that starry summer night in the middle of that football field, I couldn't tell you much about theology of the Holy Spirit, but the, the power of God moved in such a life-changing way. I didn't see beams of light, of heavenly light, but I was forever changed. What an amazing story humility, going from standing to kneeling to lying down on his face to digging a hole to place his nose in and saying, Lord, use me. And, and, and Rogers says that life-changing encounter, that moment, he was never the same. In our passage this morning in Genesis 20. Eight, we will see Jacob's response to a life in changing encounter with God. Let's begin reading in verse 10 and we'll, we'll stop where we left off last Sunday. Verse 10 of Genesis 28. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in the place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it, the ladder. And behold, the, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of of Jacob, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall be all the families of the earth, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. What a remarkable story, this trickster out on the run. Jacob wasn't seeking God. He was running out of fear. But God shows up in his dream, and in this dream, Jacob sees a ladder, the text from says from earth to heaven, and this is a, a two-way street, this ladder. You have angels, these spiritual beings, these messengers from God, coming from heaven in the presence of God to earth, but you also have some ascending, come, going from earth to heaven. So Jacob, in this text, he is not seeking after God. God is seeking after 
Jacob. And Jacob's position here is the same as all men because Paul says in Romans chapter 3 that no one seeks after God. No, not one. None are good. But this gospel-centered vision of angels going up and out of on this ladder, these spiritual beings, this ladder is not about man climbing to heaven. This vision, this dream, is of heaven coming to man. God coming to man, and God did come to man, did he not? In the form of a man, God took on flesh with the incarnation, Jesus, who is eternal, the Son of God who has always existed. There has never been a moment that Jesus Christ did not exist. The thrice holy Son of God loved man so much that he took on flesh and he came to earth. And in doing so, he made a way. He is the ladder here. Because Jesus said in John chapter 1 to Nathaniel, I am the ladder. He tells Nathaniel, one day you will see angels ascending and descending on me. And in this dream that, that, that God reveals himself to Jacob, God reaffirms to Jacob the promise that he had made with his, great, his grandfather, Abraham. A, a promise, a covenant of blessing, of land, and of, of offspring. But in a special way, there's almost a, a new promise here. That God would be with Jacob the entire way of his life. So as we consider this experience with God, I think we need to be reminded that it is God who puts us in places where we can experience him. Even through deception and fear, God gets Jacob where Jacob doesn't want to be, but he gets Jacob where Jacob needs to be. Where does Jacob want to be? In Beersheba, right? Jacob wants to be home with mom and dad. But that's not where he needed to be. That's not where God wanted him to be because God is going to change his life and he used those events to get him out of Beersheba, uh, Beersheba, and now he is at Bethel. We need to remember, God uses the circumstances of life. God uses our trials, our tribulations, our sins, our failures, and he uses all the things that happen for a purpose. Don't forget that often when we get moved in life, when there are transitions, we need to recognize God is bringing us to a place, to a, to a position where we can experience Him. And if we're in a place where we can experience God, we will never be the same. So Jacob, beginning here in verse 16, he responds to this encounter. Verse 16, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate So Jacob wakes up, and he says, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I'm sure you know that the song, Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. 
I'm not going to sing it. I'll, I'll say it for you. The, those words come from this text, and, and he says, as he wakes up, the, the Lord is here, and he says, this place is awesome. Awe. Oh, this, this, this place of fear and being awestruck. This place is amazing. And he, and he knew and he understood that this was the gate to heaven. How, how could this be the gate of heaven? What does he mean here? Well, God shows up, right? This is the place in Jacob's life where the gates of heaven were open and God met Jacob where he is. In a dream, in his vision, Jacob, and even after this vision, Jacob is a man of trust in God. The promise of God came in a dream, but Jacob's, Jacob's response comes when he's awake. And we can see Jacob trust the God of his dreams even more than the circumstances of life. Jacob sees God, he hears God, he accepts God's word, and I believe he responds rightly. Jacob was in fear. It says in verse 17, he was afraid in fear of the one true and living God. I ask you, what is the proper response to God's presence? In the scriptures, what is often the narrative when a man encounters God? Consider with me with Joseph, at, uh, Moses at the burning bush, the book of Exodus. God told Moses, take off your sandals for you are standing on holy ground. Later on in, in Exodus 33, Moses asked God, show me your glory. And God responded, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand until I have passed by, and then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my, my back, but my face shall not be seen. Man cannot see God and live. That's what he tells Moses. What about Isaiah? In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has a vision of God on his throne. His robe fills the throne room. And he sees a seraphim flying with six wings, with two that cover their eyes, with two wings they fly, with two wings they cover their feet, and they are ever saying, Holy, holy is the, the Lord of hosts. And, and Isaiah sees God and, and he says, Oh, am I a man of unclean lips? And here Jacob sees God, but in a dream. He wakes up afraid. This special moment in Jacob's life, this time, this place, is where the divine presence of God transforms his life. Friends, you don't understand God until you experience God. You will never fully understand Him, but He is but an abstract thought until He intervenes in your life. And although He 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 did learn God was with Him, we need to recognize that God was always with Jacob. God chose Jacob from birth. God loved Jacob, and he hated Esau. And God chose him of the twins, and he loved him, and he was with him every step of the way of his life. So we have not only this ladder connecting earth to heaven, but we have this relationship that connects God with Jacob. 
And notice how he responds. First, he responds with worship. So early in the morning, verse 18, early in the morning, Jacob took the stone and he had put under his head and set it up for an altar and poured out on the top of it. Verse 19, and he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. So he takes this this stone, this hard pillow that he was sleeping on, and he takes this rock and sets it up as a pillar, and he pours oil on it. This is a, a special act. This is a like a religious ceremony to consecrate this place. Now, often in the scriptures, when there are, are pillars or uh, or Asher poles, that, that is in terms of idolatry. When pagans would worship other gods, they had pillars and poles. And they would worship gods such as Baal. But here Jacob sets up a stone and honors the one true and living God and, and worships him. And he pours oil on it. And, and oil in the scriptures often symbolized or meant holiness because this was a, a holy place to Jacob. This was a special place in Jacob's life. I, I don't know about you, but there have been some special places in my life. I'm sure if you're a Christian, you probably know that moment, that place where you placed your faith in Jesus Christ. I remember. I remember that summer. I remember the pastor on the on the stage, I remember the pew I was sitting in. I was in Dry Creek, Louisiana. And I will always remember the moment that Jesus saved me. And there have been other times throughout my life where, where there were special places that I encountered and experienced the living God. Those are special times. And those are things we need always keep in mind that God blesses us in a special way. Surely the presence of the Lord is here. And in response, we worship and consecrate this place. This place he calls Bethel. Also called Luz. Special place. Uh, Bethel means the house of God. It is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 12 where Jacob's grandfather Abraham built an altar there and worshiped God. The next chapter in chapter 13, Abraham after visiting Egypt returned to Bethel and offered another sacrifice and worshiped God. Jacob here builds a pillar at Bethel. In Judges, it tells us that the Ark of Covenant was kept at Bethel for a time and many other times throughout the, the Old Testament. Now, Bethel isn't mentioned in the New Testament, but Bethel, this place, is a special place, the house of God. This is where God met man. You know, we call the church the house of God. Often churches are called sanctuaries, a temple. But we call the church the house of God. So we can take it a step further. The, the believer, your, your body is the temple of the living God. But when we think of this place, this house of God, God, God is not confined to a house. God does not need this church house nor does he need man. We need this house. We need this place of worship. We need this sanctuary of praise where we can gather in the name of Jesus as Christians and experience God here. God doesn't need this. He doesn't need us. He didn't need Jacob. But God, out of his loving kindness, 
chooses to have relationships with us, and he has created ways where we can experience him. Oh, God is so gracious to us with his presence. For friends, his presence is a grace. It's a gift. And we do not deserve it. This is Bethel. And we could contrast Bethel with Babel, right? Babel is the place in Genesis, the beginning of Genesis, where the people built a tower and they were trying to build their way to heaven. They wanted to build this this tower to heaven and, and God sh- struck the building and he struck their tongue and spread them across the earth. But Babel's the opposite. Bethel's the opposite. Babel man is trying to earn his way to heaven, but Bethel is with Jacob's ladder where God shows himself to man and God comes down to man. So Jacob responds in worship. Next he responds with commitment. Verse 20 of Genesis 28. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I may I come again to my father's house in peace. Then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set up for a pillar, shall be God's house. Now, notice with me in verse 20. He says, if, if God be with me. Now, we know Jacob, he likes to bargain. Esau, if, you, if I give you this stew, you got to give me your birthright. But commentators are divided about what Jacob is trying to say here. It, if, if he is saying, if God does these things, then he will be with then I, then he will be my god if god does these things it, you you could read that and see that he's trying to bargain with god but that same word for if could mean since in the hebrew and if you interpret it that way it says since god does these things he will be my god that's a more of a affirmative response i believe Either way, this vow is a vow of faith. And one reason, I believe, is especially the fact that God does not correct Jacob. He just makes this vow to God. God, he's coming out of this dream. He makes this commitment. He makes this vow to God. And we see here that this vow, this commitment, God is Jacob's God. And and Jacob is God's man. And Jacob comes out changed. He comes out committed. This encounter from God demanded a response from Jacob. And Jacob responded rightly with a new commitment. I, I remember growing up in church and there was this one individual it seemed like every Sunday they would good go forward during the invitation and they would rededicate their life to the Lord it just at first you just step back and say why, why are you doing this all the time but as I, I look back I think we probably need to do that almost every day right We need new commitments to God. We need to make some new rededications to God. That's not proper grammar. We need to respond to God in a way saying, God, I'm not the same. You have changed me, and from this moment on, God, I will do better. Friend, How are you responding to God's goodness and God's grace? How are you, are you responding in awe? Are you responding in worship? Are you responding with commitment because you have changed? 
Beloved, God is for you, and He wants to transform you and grow you in your faith. He, he loves you. He wants what's best for you. Friend, maybe in this moment, in this time, you need a new re- a, a recommitment to God. Maybe you've drifted away from God. Maybe you're complacent in your faith. You just lack the daisical. Maybe you're just going through the motions. And, and God is your God, but you're not really living for Him. Friend, I, I want to encourage you today. Your life can change. God is here. He is, he is here, and He wants to, to bless you in such a special way. M- maybe you this morning just need to make a, a new commitment to God. And although we're not perfect, God can use us in those instances for His glory. And notice the last response before we close. Verse 22. And all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. He responds with gifts. Jacob commits a tenth, a tithe. Now this tithe, this tenth, isn't a religious offering. That's not a command instituted yet. But Jacob acknowledges. He responds. He says, knowing that God, it's all yours, so I'm giving you a tenth back. Notice verse 22. And all that you give me. Jacob recognized all that he has is from God. 100%, friend, of what we have is from God. And Jacob, this deceiver, this trickster, now belongs to God. But up to this point, Jacob was just taking, and now Jacob's life's changing, and now he's giving. Up to this point, he is stealing a a birthright and a blessing from his brother. And from this moment on, he says, God, all that you give to me, I'm giving you a tenth. Surely, this is some sign of faith in his life, right? Friend, I, I, I believe when we give to God, when we give a tithe, that expresses our faith and trust in Him. For if we keep it to ourselves, if we hoard, if we store up our banks, aren't we depending on ourselves 100% and fully? But when we give back to God, we're not only expressing, God, it's yours, we're not only expressing, God, I, I want to bless you and your, your ministry, but we're saying, God, I trust you. I trust you to provide for me because it all comes from you. Friends, how will you respond to God's presence? May we respond with worship. May we respond with commitment. And may we respond with giving. This morning, what is the, that transforming moment in your life? What is it in your life that God is using to prepare you for something greater? What is that? As we close, we have our time of invitation as the accompanists come. Once again, th- this is what I want you to do. It, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a child of God, the gospel says God loves you so much. God loves you. And He wants to save you. You need to be saved because you're a sinner who is separated from God. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God, in His love, the Scriptures say in Romans 5, 8, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
and placing our faith in Jesus, believing in a death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, He will save you. We are saved by grace through faith. Would you trust in Jesus today? So this is what I want you to do. As soon as I say amen, I want you to stand up and come forward, and I would love to pray with you. Lord, maybe you're here this morning, and and you're a Christian, but you need to make a new commitment to the Lord. You feel God calling you to do something. Whatever God's calling you to do, just say yes and do it. And I wonder if this Sunday, uh, May 26, 2024, will be such a special day in your life that you can say, all this changed for God's glory and for our good. Would you stand with me? Let's pray.